Let's just start really with a word of prayer, okay? Father, we just thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to turn to your word, to gather together as the saints of God, the set-apart ones, and to be in this place, set apart on a Saturday morning when we could be doing other things. But we choose today to come and be in your presence. We choose today to come and fellowship with one another. We choose today to gather around your word, to worship you, and Lord, to pray and decree and proclaim and declare the kingdom of God into the atmosphere over this nation, that, Father, we may see revival, societal transformation, cultural awakening, and, Lord, all the things that we need to see in this dark land, because it is a dark land, Lord, but we thank you that, Lord, we can arise and shine and our light will dispel the darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, uh, let's turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, for our, if you like, our scriptural foundation. There's a bit of scripture to go through today, but I want to just start with this. It says, do not lay up for yourselves, verse 19, Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, or single, or wholesome, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We've looked at this recently, um, but there's more thoughts I believe the Holy Spirit wants to bring out for us today and, and take us into something where we understand this a lot better and deeper. And then he goes on to say, therefore I say you do not worry about your life and so on. What he's really saying is this is how you serve mammon, by worrying about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, how you're going to pay the bills and so on. But this is the verse I want us to go to. Uh, verse 32. After all these things, what things? The things that you need, the things that you desire, new clothes, food, shelter, all that. A car to drive. For after all these things, the nations seek, the Gentiles seek, Okay. In other words, what he's saying is people are look, seeking these things. Okay, He's not saying it's wrong to seek them, but they are pursuing them. People got up in the morning. I heard someone say recently, uh, I think it was Joseph Prince said, do you work for money because you need money? Or do you work doing something you love and then the money follows? After all these things the nations seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. This is what I want to say about all this. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Let me just say this to you. God has put you and I into an environment where we need things. We need stuff. Amen? You need clothes. You need um, food. You need a roof over your head. You need money for your electricity bill. You need petrol for your car. Some things are luxuries, other things are necessities, but your heavenly father knows you need them, so he has no problem with you needing them. Now, you may know some Christians, and, and we all know these kind of folks, and, and they're the, oh, well, I don't need anything but Jesus. I don't need money. I don't need things of this earth. <laughs> That's rubbish, okay? Your heavenly father knows you need things. He put you in a place and an environment where you need stuff so that he can show you he's your provider. Amen? Uh, and you need to know him as provider because, let me say this, you will keep needing things if you don't know that the Lord is my shepherd provider. I shall not need. I shall not lack. Okay? So that relationship with him where he is your supplier, your provider, your shepherd, the one who looks after you, he wants that relationship with you, and so he has allowed need to come into your life. Okay, in other words, it's not wrong that you need food because you would just die if you didn't eat. It's not wrong that you need clothes because you wouldn't be able to leave the house if you didn't have any. Okay, it's not wrong 
that you need a car and petrol to put in it and all of it and your MOT bill paid and so on so that you can come to the gathering and go to the shops and go to your job. and everything. So anyway, he knows you need... Now watch what he says though. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness... And all these things shall be added to you. What things? The things you need. So he's saying you need these things, but you don't have to chase them. You don't have to worry about them. You don't have to work to get them. If that's the only reason you're working, well, I need to pay my bills. He says your heavenly father knows you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and they'll all just flow to you. Okay? That's the bit that we, 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 we just read this. Oh, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And we read that through the religious specs, don't we? Because what we think it's saying is, oh, put God first and live a righteous life. That's not what he's saying. But that's what religion will teach you. And, I, and, and Agnes will tell you this. I get communications from people. Um, and, you know, oh, what am I going to do? Um, they're cut, they're, they took my car last week. They're, they're going to repossess my house. I'm, I'm going to be evicted. Uh, but I'm a faithful tither. And I give till it hurts. What have I done wrong? And this is very often, this verse, is what they use. Well, I put God first. I put the kingdom first. But that's not what Jesus is saying. And I actually believe that Jesus is speaking in a coded message here. We've already looked at a bit of that because I, I believe what Jesus is telling us is to remember the Abrahamic covenant. But there's more to it as well that we're going to look at today. That's what we're going to look at today. This is just the intro. How do you seek first the kingdom? What does he mean by that? Does he mean put God's first? Does he mean put God's kingdom first? No. That's not what he's saying. I'm not saying that we shouldn't put God first. I'm not saying that we shouldn't put his kingdom first. But is that what gets all these things added to you? If that's the case, what about all the people who put God first, who tithe, who give till it hurts, give sacrificially, and they don't have a penny? What's wrong? What are they doing wrong? They're not interpreting this verse the way that we should interpret the verse. Because what he's saying is, seek first the kingdom of God. What does he mean by that? What does the kingdom mean? It means, let's write this down, okay? Kingdom means, if, you, if there's a kingdom, it means that there is a king. Yeah? You can't have a kingdom without a king. So the, the king, there's a king, and a kingdom means there's a king and his domain. In other words, there's a place, there's a territory where the king rules over, reigns over. Yeah? The king and his domain. That's a kingdom. A kingdom is a king and his domain. Okay? And Jesus says, seek first the kingdom, the king and his domain. In other words, you have to know who the king is, and you have to know what his domain is, and you have to know your place in it. That's what righteousness means. Seek first the king and or the kingdom and his the king and his domain, the kingdom, and his righteousness. The king and his righteousness. The kingdom, the dominion of the king and his righteousness. What does righteousness mean? Well, it means to live right, brother. Yes, it does. Okay. But who's living right in this room? We're doing our best. But who's righteous as in you've never sinned? Mm -hmm. Now, let me just say this to you. That's everyone in this room. But all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So we've all, we've all sinned. We've all been sinners. But in order to have a status of no sin, you have to be righteous. If you can't be righteous in your own strength, somebody has to give you righteousness. Does that make sense? 
The word is right just, it doesn't just mean without sin. It also means to have right standing, okay? Um, if you have right standing with someone, then you're welcome into their presence. If you have right standing, this is what Jesus is talking about here, folks. If you have right standing with the king, then you can go into his presence. Sit down, put your feet up, relax. How are you doing? Not irreverently. Not, you know, glibly and blasé. But you can sit in the king's presence. Okay? Um, and in fact, if you're a servant, you have to stand. But if you're on an equal footing with the king, if you're another king, then you sit. Amen? Do you see that? So you can sit comfortably um, in the king's presence if you have right standing with him. Does that make sense? Right standing. Now, here's, here's, a good, here's a good one, okay? Let me show you this, what, what I'm talking about. Now, understand that when I'm saying this, I'm going really what the media tells us. We don't really know what goes on behind the scenes. We don't, okay? So to pretend otherwise, but from the media perspective, okay, if, if you're a prince or you're royalty, you can come into the king's presence and you're welcome, you're right standing. Okay, if you're just Joe Schmo off the street, you can't do that, am I right? But what if you don't have right standing with the king? So I'm, again, I'm going with what the media are telling us right now. Okay? And here's two princes. Okay? William and Harry. Now, from our understanding in the media, who has right standing with King Charles right now? It's William, isn't it? The heir to the throne, his son, and so on. Does Harry have right standing if you listen to the media? No. He can't just walk walk in. Hi, hi Dad, I'm, I'm home. I'm back from L.A. That can't happen. Why? Because he doesn't have the same right standing as William, according to the media. Okay, I'm just giving you illustrations here. Right? Whether that's true in private life, I don't know. But the point I'm trying to say to you is, if you don't have righteousness, which is right standing with the king, you're not allowed to enter his presence. Now, I shared this other night in Bible college, uh, and I want to emphasize it right now. You cannot enter the presence of the king without righteousness being conferred on you. And you can't enter the presence of the king without him conferring upon you a certain status, which is to be a king priest. Does that make sense? Let's read Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Uh, and it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, the Lord there is, the first Lord is capital letters, which means Yahweh or God the Father. The second Lord is only capitalized at the L, so it's low, low case, you know. And really what we know, and we know this from the New Testament, this is the Father God speaking to Jesus. Okay? The Lord, the Father, God, said unto my Lord, David said, remember that a thousand years before Jesus walked the earth, David was calling him Lord. <laughs> Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That's the point. Sit at my right hand. Jesus, of course, had right standing with the Father. So he had that relationship with his Father where God didn't, didn't say, you stand there, boy. And do as I tell you. Oh, sit at my, sit, sit at my right hand, son. Why? Because he's right standing. You know, if you have children, um, th then you don't make them stand at your right hand while you're watching TV. Sit down, son. What are you doing? David is always standing, isn't he? And we keep saying, sit down. Oh, no, I'm all right, I'm all right. But you can't walk into my house. Well, anybody here can. But if you, I don't know you, you can't walk into my house and sit and watch TV without anything. You know, hello, you know, you're treated as an intruder, a trespasser. Why? You don't have right standing. 
You don't have the right to come and sit in my house unless I know you and you're invited. Does that make sense? That's what Jesus is talking about. Seek first the dominion of God. Understand what dominion is and understand your righteousness, meaning your right, your right standing with God to function in that dominion, in that kingdom, in the throne room. This is all about the throne room, folks. Okay? Where's all the action in a kingdom? It's not way out there in the streets. It's in the throne room. We call it the halls of power, the corridors of power. But in a kingdom, all the power, all the authority is in the throne room or where the king is. You see that? And Jesus is saying, you need an understanding of how kingdom works and your right to function in that kingdom. That's what he's talking about in Matthew chapter 6. And that's why a lot of people, I'm just paying the Lord here. I'm giving him my tithe and I'm, and I'm offering, giving him offerings. Uh, but why are they coming to, why are they coming to, you know, why are the sheriff officers at the door? Because you haven't sought first the king in his domain and you don't know what your right standing is. I, but I put God first. Well, so do loads of people. But they can't function. Why is things not been added to me? Because you haven't sought first the, the dominion of God, the king. You don't know who the king is. You don't know what his dominion is. And you don't know your right standing and your right to function in this. You think you, you just pay God some money and all these things will come. Now there's where a lot of the prosperity gospel misses it. Well, just give big to God and he'll give big back to you. Well, there's a truth there, but it's not the whole truth. If you don't know who you are, and really what we're talking about then is identity, and that's what I'm teaching on today, identity. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make the name of thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing. This is a bit I want us to go to. This verse where it says, The Lord, or Yahweh, hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What I'm speaking about today, folks, is king priest ministry, or we would call it the order of Melchizedek. Okay? The order of Melchizedek. You are a priest, Jesus, after the order of of Melchizedek, not just a priest, but a king priest. Okay, there are lots of priests, as we know, right? But and there are lots of kings. But the order of Melchizedek is the order of the king priest, king priest ministry. And it's speaking here about uh, having a rod uh, of strength and so on. And so he's speaking about Messiah or Jesus being a king priest after the order of Melchizedek. He is the king priest at Yahweh's right hand, and he has authority in heavenly realms. David is getting a vision here of the heavenly throne. So the authority of Jesus to rule in the heavenlies comes because he's seated at God's right hand in the throne room of heaven. We talked about this the other night in Bible college in our studies on uh, the, the life of David, or the leadership lessons from the life of David. Now, um, what I want you to see here is is this. It's it's all about the order of Melchizedek, okay? And the order of Melchizedek. Uh, let's let's turn to Hebrews chapter seven to look at this. There's a lot of stuff related to this, uh, but, but I don't want to end up going into it all because we won't get to where we want to go today. Um, but it's, it's all about the throne of David and so on. But, but let's just look at Melchizedek. Okay? For this, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, or king of Jerusalem, yeah? Priest of the Most High God. Now, there's a king priest there. Melchizedek was a king priest. And Abraham tithed to him. What did he tithe to him? The spoils of war. The spoils of the battle that took place 
um, that's recorded in Genesis, he, he gave him the spoils, he tithed out of the spoils of war. Okay? Now, oh yes, Abraham was a tither, he tithed to Melchizedek. He tithed the spoils of a battle. Doesn't say in the Bible that he tithed all the time to Melchizedek or anyone else. I'm going to ask you a question. Oh, well, Abraham was a tither pastor, was he? Well, who did he tithe to? Where was his local church? He tithed to Melchizedek the spoils of war. I, I tithed today because Abraham was a tither. He tithed the spoils of war, which was the right thing to do. But Abraham, when it says he was a tither, where does it say that, that he tithed regularly? Where does it say, where did he take his weekly tithe? Folks, you need to read the Bible and stop listening to what men tell you. If it's not Bible as, okay? Anyway, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king uh, of peace. Oh, well, Abraham gave him a tithe of all. Was Abraham carrying all his wealth with him when he went to the, to the battle of the kings? No, it means he gave him a tithe of all that he took from the spoil of the battle. Because it tells us that in verse 4. Now consider how great this man was, that's Melchizedek, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils or the plunder or that which had been taken from the battle. Okay? Now watch this. Let's go back. Abraham gave a tenth part, first being translated. This is Melchizedek. It means, in Hebrew, king of righteousness. And he's also known as the king of Salem, meaning the king of peace. Okay? So Abraham, eh, sorry, Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. That's what it means. Melchizedek, the name means king of righteousness. Okay? And his name as, or his title as king of Jerusalem or king of Salem means king of peace. You cannot have peace without righteousness. But what I want to show you here is this. If you go and look at this, if you looked at it in the Greek, you would see what I'm trying to say. Look what Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6. Seek first the king, dumb, or the domain of the king, and his righteousness. The basilea, and then the word for righteousness, which I forget right now. And then it says here, Bas uh, the Melchizedek, king of righteousness, that means Basileus, and then the word for righteousness. In other words, these are very, very similar things, very similar terms. Jesus is saying, seek first the king and his righteousness. And we could easily say, seek first the king of righteousness. You see that? You see, if you seek first the king of righteousness, all these things shall be added to you. So in other words, what Jesus, this is what Jesus is saying, okay? Jesus is telling us here in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, well, you know, you can serve mammon or you can serve God, but serving mammon means you're going to worry about stuff all the time. You're going to fear, you're going to worry, you're going to wring your hand, we're going to pay this, oh, they're just putting that, oh, they've just put my credit card uh, uh, interest. Oh, or you can say, I'm connected to the king of righteousness. I'm connected to the order of Melchizedek, and that's my guarantee that every need is supplied, that every need is met, that every bill is paid, that, that I can eat lure pack and not have to eat. I can't believe it's not butter. You're connected to an order that puts you above all the affairs of life because you know who the king is, you know how to function in his dominion, you know that you have righteousness, 
You know that you have right standing with him. You have the right to function in the order of Melchizedek. What does the order of Melchizedek give you? It gives you that place of elevation and authority over all the affairs of this life so that the stuff you need, you don't have to chase it. It's chasing you. It's been added to you. Why? Because you're connected to the Melchizedek order. And that's what we're going to look at. Because you're not just connected to the Melchizedek order. You're in it. You're part of it. And that's what Jesus is saying. Understand how the system works. If you are, uh, if you know how the king, who the king is, you know what his dominion is, you know what your right to function in that is, you've got it made. That's what Jesus, all these things will chase, stop chasing you. The things you seek, the things you're looking for. Your heavenly father knows you need these things, but they're supposed to be chasing you. You don't have to chase them. So that's what we're going to look at. Uh, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, uh, this, before we do that, just stay in Hebrews 7. He says, um, here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Now, here's what I want to show you. The Mel Melchizedek is the banker of heaven. How do we know that? Because Melchizedek is the one who receives tithes. What Abraham was doing that day when he gave him the spouse of war was he was laying up treasures in heaven. He was banking in the, the bank of heaven. Melchizedek um, is, and, and, and you know, the Lord gave me that by revelation, I have to say. Then I found Ian Clayton was teaching that. So I thought, well, I'm a good company. Melchizedek is the banker of heaven. You see that? When you lay up treasures in heaven, you're banking in heaven. Okay? When you, when you tithe, when you give to the kingdom, you're banking in the kingdom of heaven, or you're banking in heaven's bank. You're, let's go back to Matthew 6 for a minute. Just look at that before we, we move on. Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures uh, upon earth where moth and rust destroy, in other words, where there's inflation, where your money can, can, can uh, be stolen or lost. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. What he's saying here is, bank in the bank of heaven, bank in the bank of Melchizedek. Seek ye first Melchizedek. And all these, if you bank in the bank of Melchizedek, in the bank of heaven, in the bank of the king and his righteousness, or the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If you bank in that bank, all the things will be added to you. Why? Because nothing can steal from you. Inflation cannot touch you. If lower pack goes up to £10 a tub, you'll be able to afford it. Amen? You know, you and I should never actually consider um, the price of anything. Have you seen the price of stuff? Well, you know, it doesn't make any difference if you're in the bank of Melchizedek. What the price is, you, if you want it, you pay it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. Jesus says, don't take the thought and say, oh, I can't afford that. Don't ever say that. Why? Because if you bank in the bank of Melchizedek, if you bank in Coots Bank, mm -hmm. you don't worry about the price of the pack. Am I right? Mm -hmm. If you and let me say, oh, but that's that's the highest level of bank we have here in Britain. Well, yeah, but there's a higher level of bank, and that's the Bank of Heaven, the Bank of Melchizedek. Am I right? The Melchizedek Savings Bank. Amen. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing: the the cost and value of things in earth don't matter to that bank. Let's turn to First Peter chapter 2. And look at verse 9. You are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. Or a kingdom of priests. A royal priesthood 
meaning we're all kings and priests, we're all royal priests. Uh, a holy nation, uh, his own special people. Uh, the King James says, a peculiar people. As I look around this room, I see peculiar people. But it really means special or prized possession. Why? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, or that you may broadcast how great he is. As we just sang in our, our worship song, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the King of Kings. In other words, our job is to proclaim his greatness. Now, we are kings and priests for that purpose, okay? Now, when it says royal priesthood, he's always talking about Melchizedek. He's always saying there's an order of royal priesthood or kings and priests, and it belongs to the order of Melchizedek, and, and Jesus is the head of that, isn't he? He's, he is the high priest. He is, and it's not, Jesus is not of Levi, he's not of Aaron, but he is of Melchizedek. He's the head of the order of Melchizedek. And he's the king of righteousness, and he's the king of peace, isn't he? And so um, when we seek the king and his kingdom and his righteousness, he's really saying, seek the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. The king. Yeah? You know, uh, you're not interested in lower levels. We're interested in who the king is. Amen? There's something in you, in your spirit man, that is drawn to know who the king is. And that king, of course, that, that Lord is Jesus. And, of course, God, uh, God the Father and Jesus, who has been delegated all authority in heaven and in earth. So he says here, and I want to show you this. You're a royal priesthood. You're special people. You're royalty. And, you know, if you were to go to heaven right now, if you were to just be pulled out of your body or pulled up in your body and go straight to heaven, every angel in heaven would recognize you as royalty. Why? They would recognize that you're in the king, and the king is in you. And he's conferred upon you his right standing, his own standing. Does that make sense? Does Jesus have right standing in heaven? Does he have right standing with the Father? Of course. That you have his righteousness, his right standing. It's not an inferior one. It's not, well, you've, you've got a, an Alan one or an Agnes one or a James one, but Jesus has got the Jesus. No, 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 no. He's conferred his righteousness his right standing, his standing with God upon you and I. Isn't that wonderful? But do you believe it? Oh, well, I don't know. I know what I did back in 1984. You don't know, Pastor, but I remember, you know. Well, folks, it's not about what you did. It's about what he did for you and conferred upon you. And what he's saying is, when you seek all that, or in other words, well, put it another way, when you seek your identity, when you know who you are, all the things will be added to you. When you know who you are in the order of Melchizedek, you don't need to worry about the price of stuff or the, the, the value of stuff or the scarcity of stuff or your right to receive it. Well, I don't know, you know, if, if, if I don't know if I'm worthy enough to drive a Bentley. So I'm going to believe God for a Ford Focus. Or a Vauxhall, or whatever. You understand? It's not about driving Bentleys, folks, or what you know, or whatever car. It's not really about that. But the, I think a lot of things that we don't do, and we don't buy, or we don't receive, is because we don't really know that we're worthy of that, or we don't think that we are. Am I right? I don't. You know, I'm just live alone. I, I'm happy with my flat. Why? Why would I want a 16 bedroom mansion, Pastor? Right. Well, so that you can have 15 of your pals staying with you. Amen. And bless them by living in your big luxury mansion. Amen. Because it's not about you. It's about others, isn't it? Anyway, let's just. Okay. You are a royal priest. Now, this is what I wanted to see. He says, you should show forth the, the praises of him 
who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, here's the thing I want you to see. To be a king priest, to be a royal priesthood, means that God has taken you from darkness to light. Now, what did Jesus say over Matthew chapter 6? He says, if your eye is single, then your body will be full of light. In other words, that you walking in the light as he is in the light, you flooding your body temple with light, you staying in the light is vital for you to be in the order of Melchizedek. And Jesus says here, you, you can't let darkness in because you, when you're seeking first the king and his domain and his righteousness, in other words, when you're seeking your identity in the order of Melchizedek, that's essential for these things to come to you because when you flood your body with darkness because you fill your thoughts with Oh, I'm so unworthy. Oh, oh, when you, when you take your focus off who you are and your identity in Him, then you start to receive the thoughts of the identity that Satan wants you to have, which is you're no good. You're not worthy. You don't, you don't belong here. And you should never have a, a, a penny above subsistence level because you're not worthy. But when you have His righteousness, you're worthy. Amen? If the person comes to your door that you don't know and walks into your house, you say, you're, you don't have right standing to do that. But if someone comes in, a friend, or come in, sit down. You want a cup of tea? You've just conferred worth on that person. Does that make sense? So that's what we're looking at. You are, everyone in this room is a king priest. Now let's turn to Revelation chapter 1. Why is this important? Because if we want to change this nation, if you want to transform society, if you want to bring revival, then I don't believe God's going to give that to beggars. Oh, we have to have prayer meetings. Oh, we're on our knees and begging God to move in this land. Well, let me tell you, those prayer meetings have been going on for years, and the reason why nobody goes to them anymore is because nothing happened. Not because, oh, well, you just have to try harder. You just have to do more. You're praying five hours a day. Well, you make it ten, brother. Ten of what? Begging, squalling, bawling. But is revival a thing? Is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Yet Jesus says, seek first the kingdom. And his righteousness and all these things, all things shall be added. You see, I believe that God is withholding revival. And I don't mean that as he's, oh, I'm not sending revival. What I'm saying is, I believe that God is saying the old wineskin way of getting revival where you begged and begged and begged and squalled and bawled. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm doing a new wineskin thing. Okay, and it's not begging, it's knowing who you are. It's knowing your righteousness. You see, you have the right and I have the right to release revival everywhere we go. To release the spirit everywhere we go. We have the right to walk in his glory. And that's why you notice in Isaiah chapter 60, which Bill Johnson teaches and others teach, that's the end time generation, Ian Clayton. Uh, said, I think to me, Stevie, and maybe others, that Isaiah 60 is all about Scotland in these times. And what does he say? He doesn't say beg, ball, squall. He says, arise, shine, for your light has come. And when you do that, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you, and his glory shall be seen. Mm -hmm. It says nations and kings will come to you because his glory is going to be seen upon you. Now, let me just say this to you. Kings don't go to anybody except kings. Okay? Kings don't rent uh, being Airbnb. When a king visits from another country, visits Britain, they stay in a royal palace. And they don't come to see you. Oh, I need to go and see, you know, the folks. That, they don't come to see you and I. They come to see other kings. Royalty is always attracted to royalty. You notice we don't have Rishi Sunak in here this morning? Amen. But the reason we don't is he doesn't hang out with people beneath his level. 
Okay? Unless he's wanting votes. But what I'm trying to say here is this. It says kings will come to the brightness of your rising. Rising how? Rising into our understanding of being the Melchizedek order. Being kings and priests. Kings recognize kings. And that's true. And I'm not just talking about royalty per se, but, you know, Richard Branson doesn't hang out with the guy that owns a local chip shop. He hangs out with other tycoons. So if kings are going to come to you, then there has to be something changes in you that all of a sudden you realize, well, I'm a king. I'm royalty. And all these kings, and when, see, Solomon was raised up, wasn't he? Now, Solomon didn't go to other kings to get wisdom from then. Other kings came to Solomon just to hear him speak because what Solomon said would help them rule as kings in their own kingdoms. Just picking up, oh, you know, Solomon said a phrase. Well, I'm taking that phrase. I've traveled hundreds of miles and I'm going home now. And Solomon said a sentence. I'm taking that sentence home with me. It's going to make me a better king. Folks, that's the level that God wants you and I to operate in. Seek ye first the order of Melchizedek, that place of being a king priest, where the king of kings functions through you to change everything around you. And when that happens, kings will seek you out. Business leaders will seek you out. Politicians will seek you out. Community leaders will want to know you and hear what you have to say and take your advice. That's what I believe God's calling us into. That's why I believe the gathering is the gathering. Right? Not just so we can pray and beg, because let me just tell you, there's plenty of prayer meetings for that. And I, I've been to many of them over the years, and it's not worked yet. I've been to prayer meetings where we have stuff, done stuff that has impacted society. And I can tell you right now, it wasn't begging that did it. God has not called you to be a beggar. He's called you to be in the order of Melchizedek. Revel let's just finish this with the scripture. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the firstborn or the first begotten of the dead, and the prince or the ruler over the kings of the earth. Okay? Oh, yes, we know that's Jesus. But look what it says. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Don't you understand that it's that, that all of this royal priesthood stuff that pertains to our ministry as king priests in the order of Melchizedek, it all happens because he has loved us. You understand that? He loves us. And so he makes us kings and priests. Because it says in the next verse, and has made us kings and priests. To his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God has made us, Jesus has made us kings and priests. In other words, what he said is, well, it's good that you worship me. It's good that you follow me. But I'm going to raise you up. That as I am, so are you in this world. Now, you don't get that in most churches. But that's what the Bible says. First uh, John chapter 4, verse 17, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, I remember putting that on Facebook once, and a very well-known part, oh, you can't say that. I says, I didn't. The Bible said it. If you don't know the Bible, what the Bible says about you, you're already in religion. You're already in trouble because you're going to follow what man says. And man says, we need to be beggars, worms, and wimps, and all that before the Lord. But what God's word says about us, what God's word says about us, not what Pastor Bill says, or Kenneth Copeland says, or whatever, what God's word says about us, that is reality. If he says, as he is, so am I in this world, or so are we in this world, then that's who we are. Because he said we are. And that's what makes our love perfect. 
And that's what gives us boldness in the day of judgment. And if you're fearing the day of judgment, then you haven't understood what he says. Because, as I said, kings don't beg to other kings. Kings, you know, I don't know, in Europe now where all the kings are or whatever. But, you know, I'm quite sure when they come to visit King Charles and Prince William or something, they don't get down on their knees and, how are you doing? Why? Because kings and kings. And Jesus says, I've made you kings and priests. Come boldly, come boldly, come boldly to the throne of grace. Come boldly to the throne. If you visited King Charles today, would you come boldly? Or would you be, oh, yes, your majesty, showing respect, fine. But would you go with fear? And Jesus said, don't come with fear, come boldly. See, we need to, and that's why he says all these things will be added to you when you understand what kingdom is, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When you understand it, you won't come in fear and worry because fear and worry is what serving mammon is. Serving the system. All right. Well, let's look at our last scripture before we uh, finish this. Revelation chapter 5. But what I want you to see here is, in Revelation 1, he talks about being washed in the blood. Then Revelation chapter 5, but let's read from verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. He just said that in chapter 1. He's saying it again in chapter 5. He's made us kings and priests to our God. So we are ordained by God to be kings and priests. And I said that would be the last scripture, and it's not, and I apologize because I wanted to point this out before we close. It says he's made us kings and priests by the blood of a lamb. You see that? Now, let me just go back here to Revelation chapter 3 and show you something. Because I need to qualify that. We're all kings and priests. Everybody in this room is in this order of Melchizedek. We're all kings and priests. We're all the royal priesthood. It's all ours. It's not available to us. It belongs to us, if that makes sense. You already have it. You don't need to uh, obtain it or achieve it or beg for it or whatever. You already have it. But just because you have it doesn't mean to say that you're walking in it or functioning in it or your experience, you're not experiencing it maybe. Okay? And we all could experience it more than we are. So I want to show you something, Revelation chapter 3. And verse 21, we won't read all the other stuff. Jesus is talking here, he says, To him that overcomes, to him who overcomes, to him that overcometh in the kingdoms, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. What he's saying is that he gives his king priest authority, he tells us to join the order of Melchizedek. You just get saved. You're now in the order of Melchizedek. Uh, it's granted to you to sit with him on his throne, to share authority with him, seeking you first the kingdom and his domain and his righteousness. He's saying it's all yours. But here's what he says, to him that overcometh, you can do this. What does he mean by that? What he's saying here is this, is that if you're blasé about it, you don't care about it, or you're a quitter, or you're not interested, you'd rather watch EastEnders, you'd rather you know, do other stuff, then you, you can't function in it. That's what he's saying. To him that overcometh. In other words, the order of Melchizedek is for overcomers. What does that mean? It means for people who are serious about doing business with God and who want to overcome everything that they encounter in life. It's for overcomers. It's not just for, well, I'm a Christian, I'm happy to sit in my pew, but don't ask me to do anything else. 
If you get out of your bed on a Saturday morning to come here, then you're already an overcomer because you overcame <laughs> the lure of your warm bed to come out in a cold day. Does that make sense? So it's for overcomers. It's for people who are serious. It's for us. It's for those who gather. It's for those who are meeting business with God. So let me encourage you. You know, that's what it's for. Okay? Now, how do you overcome then? Because overcoming isn't just getting out of your bed. There's stuff to overcome in life. Well, Revelation chapter 12 says that we overcome Satan, the accuser of the brethren who accuses him day and night. He says he, they, we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. So when Jesus is telling us here that we're kings and priests by the blood of the Lamb, and that we, 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 we sit in the throne with him because we're overcomers, what he's saying here is this, to function in the order of Melchizedek, I'm kind of rattling through this now so that we can close, the order of Melchizedek is for overcomers, it's for people who are serious. How do you overcome? You overcome the same way that you're made a king priest, by the blood of the Lamb. Here's what I'm saying to you. To be in the order of Melchizedek, you have to have an understanding of the power of the blood of Jesus. The blood of the Lamb. You prayed it earlier uh, about the blood of the Lamb. Cover yourself with the blood of the Lamb. Plead the blood of Jesus. Use the blood of Jesus as a weapon. Overcome the devil, the accuser of the brethren, by the blood of the Lamb. There's a lot of accusing going on. Oh, well, what about him? What about him? Well, we overcome that by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, the devil's going to accuse you. You're sitting there right now, the devil's saying to you, none of this is for you. It's not available to you because God knows what you did back in 19 whenever. Well, let me just say this to you. It's, it is available to you. He's the accuser of the brethren. Shut him up with the blood of the Lamb. And the blood of the Lamb is the key to walking in the light. It tells you that in 1 John chapter 1. Uh, that um, if, you, if, he washed, if you walk in the light, he sees in the light, you fellowship one with another, and the blood of the Lamb cleanses you from all sin. Now watch this. Jesus says, well, you've got choices here. You can flood your body with light, or you can flood your body with darkness. You can bank in heaven, or you can bank in earth. Uh, you can serve God or you can serve mammon. You can worry or you can have faith. You can seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness or you can you know, live a life of worry. What he's saying here is to walk in the light, walk by the power of the blood of Jesus. That's what get, made you a king priest in the first place and that's what will keep you as a king priest. So always have the blood in your lips. Always have the blood. Plead the blood of Jesus, amen, in every part of life. It, 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 it means that you will walk and function in the order of Melchizedek and be an overcomer and he, you'll sit in his throne. You'll stay in that place of dominion. And when you stay in that place and know your rights and know your identity, all these things shall be added to you. Amen. The Lord bless you, folks. Hope that's been a blessing to you. And now we can turn our thoughts to some prayer just to close uh, what we're doing here this morning.